I'm Megan Buchter. I'm the director of the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. At the Fowler Center, we run a program called Aim to Flourish. Its purpose is to teach students about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and businesses' role in helping to achieve them. As part of the assignment, students from around the world interview business leaders or social entrepreneurs about their business innovation that's helping to achieve one or more of the global goals. They, write, they do an interview and then write a story that's then published on our Aim to Flourish website. So you can go to aimtoflourish.com to view almost 3,000 published stories written from students around the world. Also as part of this program, we do an annual Flourish Prizing process. We give out one Flourish Prize for each sustainable development goal. And today we're here talking with our Flourish Prize honorees for global goal number six, clean water and sanitation. For each of our Flourish Prizes, we celebrate the professors, the students, and the business leaders that were involved in the creation of the story. So today I have our teacher, uh, Matthew Mulhern from Beyond Borders, and our business leader, Helmi Ansari from Grosh International. So Matthew, I'm gonna start with you. Beyond Borders is actually one of our high schools that we work with, which is very exciting to have you here with us today. Um, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about how you use Aim to Flourish in your program and some of the outcomes that you've seen. Sure thing. Um, so Beyond Borders is an experiential learning program in grade 12 here in Guelph, uh, Ontario, Canada. Um, and we have a, a, one of our classes is called Sustainability in Business. Uh, it, it's a it's a class that myself and uh, a couple of the teachers have kind of put together ourselves. Um, and we were kind of looking for a, a culminating project that really kind of brought in everything that we had taught throughout the year. Um, and the kind of the UN Global Goals have kind of been our backdrop to teaching that we can kind of go through these goals and, and really look at how business uh, can be a force for good in the world and how business can kind of help achieve these UN goals. Like even in October, one of our trips is to New York and we go to the United Nations um, and really kind of get immersed ourselves in, in the work that the, that the UN does. So the students are quite familiar with, with the UN Global Goals. Uh, and a few years ago, I just kind of came across uh, Aim to Flourish and I, I don't actually know how. I just <laughs> might've been like a Google search and kind of came across like, oh, this would kind of be like a really cool project for them. Because um, a part of our program is experiential that students are actually getting out of the classroom um, you know, meeting with business owners and, and, and not just kind of being stuck in the four walls of a traditional school. Um, so we use it as our culminating project and we have students kind of choose a goal they want to focus on. They have to go out on their own. Uh, and it's for high school students that can be a little timid, right? They're kind of, you know, they don't even like talking on the phone sometimes to order a pizza. So they, you know, for them, it's kind of getting out uh, and meeting with business owners um, and asking them questions and seeing how they're and, and really highlighting a lot of the local businesses uh, around here that we think are actually working as a force for good. So the students pick a global goal that they're interested in and, and then look for a company that's striving to yeah, meet it, that? Yeah, I guess it's kind of a mixture of both. They may, they'll start looking for uh, business. They'll, we'll, we'll go through a lot of the businesses here in Guelph that we think are businesses that work beyond just for profit. Um, and we'll kind of go through them and see what kind of goals fit to kind of try to make sure that a lot of our goals are covered. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mixture of the two. They kind of have some goals that they really like and then maybe they'll find a business or sometimes they'll find a business first and see what goals really fit with that. How do your students generally go about finding the companies that they interview? I know that even for high school or even for college university students, it's often that's often the most stressful part of the assignment is finding somebody to interview. Yes, it, it, it can be tough. And again, being high school students, they not all of them have access to vehicles that they can just kind of go out. And sometimes it's just kind of looking up. And um, over the years, we've developed a, a decent relationship with a lot of businesses around here. Because um, at the end of our program, in, a, in one of their other business classes, they put on a large charitable event. Um, and they have to go out and like cold call businesses looking for donations. So they do lots of pitches all the time. So by the end of it, they're pretty confident in being able to talk. Uh, but they'll just kind of go out and maybe cold call some businesses, send some emails out, uh, or maybe or just show up at their door. That's great. That's that's great to hear. I mean, those are good skills to, to help teach students. For sure. For sure. Do you ever have students that do the interview via Zoom or, or virtually? 
Uh, I think we have, you know, Guelph, our city here is, you know, a medium sized city, 140,000, give or take. Um, so sometimes there's kind of a competition for businesses. Uh, and I believe the University of Guelph here as well also uses Aim to Flourish. Um, so sometimes they're competing with universities as well to find businesses. Um, so we have gone a little bit further out, not too much, just within our, you know, and, and sometimes that means for students, especially in the winter time when we're doing this, like we'll just do a Zoom call instead of making you drive out, you know, too far as a 17 year old. So uh, we have used Zoom and uh, or Google Meets and lots of things like that. Yeah, great. Um, so what kind of feedback do you typically get from your students that, that do the assignment? And I'm sorry, do they do it individually or in groups? They do it in uh, pairs. Okay. So in groups of two. And I would say the feedback is overwhelm overwhelmingly positive. I think at the beginning, they have sometimes they have those speed bumps of like trying to find a business and get there. But once they actually meet the business, like the, the, the businesses and the people who run the businesses and the good that they do, I think it's quite eye opening for them to to really see, you know, all the good that's happening that they often don't hear about. Um, and I think it's inspiring. I think it's great for them to it's you know, we do lots of case studies in our in our classes and things like that. So it's one thing to read it in a textbook. It's another thing to actually meet the people in person and see like, wow, you, you know, maybe I could open my own business one day. And if so, you know, I, profit doesn't always have to be the only motive. Um, so I think it, it's it's inspiring for them to be able to meet real people um, that are doing real things and doing real good in the world, as in this case here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and so then we have here with us today, Halmi from Grosh International, whom your st one of your student teams interviewed for their Aim to Flourish story. Um, Helmi, I, I, I've read the Aim to Flourish story. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about your organization. Um, sure. So Grosh is a, a small business. We're based in Cambridge, Ontario, and we have our only retail presence in Guelph, Ontario. Um, we started in 2006, and 2006 was the year when I was still working in the corporate environment. I had a very you know, happy and successful corporate career. I rose to high ranks um, in the corporate world. But um, around that time, we had a daughter who, when she was 10 months old, traveled overseas and was struck by a water waterborne illness, um, stomach cholera. And uh, for about three days, it was really touch and go for us. She was in intensive care. We didn't know if she would make it or not. And it really kind of shook me to my core, thinking I've spent my entire career, you know, dreaming that I'm going to be some CEO making so much money and rise up the ranks. And I want to have thousands of people working for me and I had these grandiose dreams. And, and when that happened to us, all of these dreams and these aspirations were suddenly meaningless. Um, you know, I was responsible for social responsibility and CSR, environmental sustainability, in my previous organization. But I really started to question, are we doing enough? Are we doing um, truly our part and not just um, doing responsibility as a defensive measure for an organization, which sometimes you see in, in very large businesses? So we started Grosh International and we started basically selling loose leaf tea uh, door to door is how we started. So during the day, I was a director for a large company and making, you know, I was responsible for uh, hundreds of people working under me, running factories and managing supply chain finance and this and that. And at night I would come home, I would pack tins of tea and I would actually sell them door to door, make a dollar, two dollars. And we started by no donating it to the sick kids hospital because we wanted the rest of our lives to be about giving back uh, and saying thank you um, for our good fortune that our daughter survived and, and she made it, but so many kids don't. You know, almost a million people lose their lives every year to something simple as not having a clean glass of water to drink. You know, we're faced with the issue of COVID right now, which is absolutely horrible. And it's challenging the world and there's such a huge response to COVID, which is great and we need to do it. But a million people a year have been dying forever because they just don't have this. So, you know, we really faced that and we saw that up close when that happened to our daughter. So we launched Grosh, we started selling products and taking the profits and initially just donating them to charity. 
over time, our business grew and we added more products and we started our own safe water project in 2010. And basically what we do is we sell the products and we take a significant portion of our profits and we, we are a for-profit business. We take those profits and we install biosand water filters uh, in different countries around the world. Um, these filters are Canadian technology. Um, they just use sand and gravel and concrete to biologically purify water to, ex to exceed UN standards. They last 25 to 30 years. They require no electricity, no chemicals. They have no moving parts. There's no cartridges to replace. It's as rock solid as you can get and purify water. Um, so yeah, we started this in 2010. Um, so we, my wife and I, and with our kids, we travel around the world and we've installed a few thousand of these filters now and have funded, I think our website says 130 million odd days of safe drinking water, but it's more like 200 million days of safe drinking water that we've already funded for people. And we're a small company based in Cambridge and Guelph. And, you know, I think for me, the, what I think students and people who come and visit us are always surprised that while well, you're a small business you're just based here you started out of the laundry room of a house selling tea door to door and you've been able to fund 200 million days of safe water for people in need i'm like yeah and we're for profit and we're competing with all the major brands and we're we're finding that you know retail customers whether they're consumers or they're retailers when they find out that this is a personal mission for my wife and I to be able to maybe career 1.0 was all about, you know, the traditional corporate success and career 2.0 is about, um, is about profit with purpose, um, you know, and being a benefit corporation and a B Corp and trying to run our business in a way that we're not just minimizing damage, which is traditional corporate social responsibility, but we're actually doing rehabilitation work for the environmental, social and other issues that is baggage that businesses sometimes create, sometimes unknowingly. We're actually trying to be on the, on the rehabilitation side. If a small business like Grosh can do this, we've, we're hoping that it inspires other businesses, small and large, to say, yes, you can be a B Corp. Yes, you can pay a living wage. Yes, you can be carbon neutral. And yes, you can actually save lives as you build consumer engagement, customer engagement, um, and, you know, it, it builds a better business at the end of the day and engagement with your staff as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's such a wonderful story. Um, you've mentioned being becoming a, a B corporation. Um, many of the companies profiled on our Aim to Flourish website are B corporations, but not not all of them. It's not any sort of prerequisite. But when you started, did you know that you wanted to become a B corporation or is that something that happened? No, um, I didn't even know about B Corps until quite a bit later. Um, I got introduced to B Corps and when I just started seeing who the B Corps are and what they do, it was so awe inspiring. I was just like, wow, we have, we have to do so much more. And, you know, by being a B Corp and joining this community, um, we're always humbled when we, when we come across other B Corps and we see the amazing things that they're doing. And, you know, we have our own beginnings from something that was very personal to us, but Every time I speak to a B Corp, I find out about how small, medium, and large businesses, there is always a personal connection, a personal desire in the people that work there um, to use their business as a force for good, as Matthew said. But it's just an inspiring community and it's awe inspiring and we feel humbled and small and inspired at the same time to do more and we get ideas and we help each other and we support each other. and. You know, we have B Corps that um, become suppliers and vendors and customers to each other. It's it's a tight knit community uh, that's very rapidly growing. Um, you know, if you think about so sustainability certifications in business, there's ISO standards and there's this and that. And there's all these complicated technical scorecards and standards and stuff that people don't, the average person you know, even as an engineer and a technical person, it would just boggle my mind. How do you expect the everyday person and consumers to understand this technical jargon behind, oh, we're this certified and this and this. B Corp simplifies all of that. You know, it's like being organic certified for an entire business, not just a product. Um, end to end, suppliers, products, staff, employees, product, everything all the way up to the customer and consumer. So it, it helps you stay 
focused on the entire business and helps you get better and better. Um, you know, these are all companies that are competing to be, to do the most good, you know, for the world that we live in. So, you know, it's an inspiring community to be a part of. Yeah. Do you feel like, like, how has that certification impacted your company? Do you feel like more people shop from Grosh because they see that B Corp logo or it's more internally motivating for you to meet the B Corp requirements? Well, it's internal and external. So on the internal side, I think our, um, it helps us um, do the right thing. It helps us audit and and measure you know everything that we're doing to make sure we are living true to our standards. We've been externally audited twice by the B Corp, you know, communities. So it's very strict and very stringent standards. Um, it, it matters to our staff who know what B Corp is and they feel proud to be part you know of a company that has a B Corporation. Externally speaking, the awareness around the B Corporation movement is still low. So I think there have been some audits and studies that, you know, less than 10% of consumers recognize the B Corp symbol. About half of them understand what it is. While it is low, it is the one thing consumers do understand outside of something like fair trade and organic, which apply to products. So from a company st standpoint, this is the certification that I think uh, is going to, you know, bring this movement forward that has a, um, has a future in the masses understanding what it is and then making that choice. There is a certain consumer who knows what B Corp is and who actively seeks out B Corps. Um, you know, in Guelph, we opened our first retail store and our only retail presence in Guelph because we knew that the, there's a higher understanding of the social and environmental business for good movement in Guelph than in other communities. And the community of Guelph and the city of Guelph has been extremely welcoming to us. People walk in saying, hey, you're a B Corp. I didn't know you were a B Corp. That's awesome. We're like, it's great that people know who B Corps are. And people, you know, people walk in going, hey, you're a B Corp. We're like, yes, we're a B Corp. You know B Corps. High five. Well, air <laughs> high five these days, but yes. <laughs> so... It's on the rise. Uh, consumers are more and more understanding it. And every time somebody walks in, they see the big B Corp symbol in our store. They see the B Corp symbol on our packaging and our product and our inserts. We're trying to do our part to spread awareness around what the movement is. And there are other B Corps in Guelph as well. So if somebody's like, hey, you know, yeah, I'm interested in fashion. We're like, oh, there's a retailer over there. They're a B Corp and they're a living wage employer. You should check them out. So we're always trying to, you know, point like-minded consumers towards other businesses because, um, it's a growing movement. There's lots of us. We're all trying to do the same thing uh, and trying to, you know, learn from each other and, and energize each other. Um, business is extremely competitive, right? And it's getting more and more competitive every day. There's big brands, mega brands, tons of marketing muscle, all this money they throw at you. They can, they're buying in large quantities. They drop their price. They're willing to flood the market and do things to drive out the competition. But B Corp step in and support each other. We have a loyal consumer base who recognizes who we are. We have a mission that we stray to stay true to. Um, and then we support each other in trying to grow, you know, each other's uh, business so that we can use business to try and make things right. Yeah, that's it. That's amazing to not only be a part of the B Corp community, but also a part of this community in Guelph, which I've never been to Guelph, but because we work with the University of Guelph and Beyond Borders, I read a lot of stories about companies in Guelph and the, all of their sustainable business practices. So um, I do feel like there there is this community in Guelph of these types of businesses. So your storefront in Guelph sells coffee and tea products? Yeah, so we have all of our physical products like our glassware, coffee makers, tea makers, whatever else. And then we've got a hundred different um, flavors of loose leaf tea and about 20 different types of uh, freshly roasted coffee. So what was to the, do with, the motivation behind doing tea and coffee? Um, so our um, seven or eight years ago, we sat down to do a brand mission. You know, we had one of those mission statement sessions. It took several, actually over a bunch of weeks. And we tried to crystallize it into a couple of statements. One was our mission is to be a source of joy in the world. Um, and you'll understand where I'm going when I'm when I'm done. So I know this seems a bit off track. Okay, so 
in the past, when I worked for the large for large corporations, our mission statements were usually crush the competition, destroy the other guys, and be the biggest and the baddest, and hit this number of sales. And this, we said, no, no, we don't want to do that. We want to be a source of joy in the world. We want to be good in our local community. We want to do the right thing in the global community. We want to sell products we're proud of. We want to treat our employees right. When it came down to the product level, that mission translated into every cup fills another. So every time I fill my cup with water, tea, coffee, whatever it is, I can actually fill somebody else's cup with clean, safe drinking water at the same time without paying extra. It's built into buying from Grosch. So when you talk about every cup fills another, it can be coffee, it can be tea, it can be water. So our products are all built around coffee, tea, and water, and that's what we focus on. So every time you buy a Grosch product, you're providing 50 plus days of safe drinking water to a person in need, automatically built in without paying extra for it. We don't want to be that $50 t-shirt that you buy that gives somebody a t-shirt in Africa. You know, that's, that's a business model that some people use. And while I think the intent is good, you have to be very careful in implementing that because the, the whole one-for-one -one model um, has certain limitations. You know, I was actually in South Sudan, I was in um, Nairobi, Kenya, in a slum, outside a slum called Kiambio. And my host took me to a, um, a really muddy street side where there were these little shanty stores with metal, corrugated metal roofs and just wooden posts, and they were selling t-shirts. And the t-shirts, I went up there, he's like, check out these t-shirts. I saw them and they're like, this one is Gucci, this one's Ralph Lauren, this one is Gap. I'm like, this stuff is authentic. So he said, yeah. I said, well, I guess this is a good thing, right? Where are these clothes coming from? He's like, oh, you know, all the clothing you guys donate in Canada and the US, it ends up here. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, so that means, you know, these people can wear good clothes and they buy them for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, and it's really worth much more than that. My host, told me, he said, ask this seller who's selling these t-shirts where he used to work before being on this muddy roadside trying to hawk t-shirts for a couple of dollars. So I did. He told me, he says, I was a manager, a supervisor in a garment factory. And I lost my job because you people in your countries are sending these t-shirts, which you think you're donating but they're being dumped in my country and they're putting me and my friends out of work. So, you know, when we do the, when we do giving, it's important to have the right intent, but it's very important to make sure the execution of that doesn't, doesn't create unforeseen side effects, uh, which in the case of donating products, whatever it is, can do. So what we do is when we do the biosand water filter programs, we don't donate filters, we don't ship any filters, we have local teams that teach the local um, people there how to make these filters. So we're creating employment because we're paying them to make the filters. We're uh, training them how to maintain the filters. Um, and in doing that, we create local social enterprises because we pay these folks to go do work that saves lives and creates employment. Well, sometimes what happens is these local social enterprises can go into the local community and once they know how to make and distribute these filters, they can actually sell some filters to people who want to buy them. So we're helping sponsor a local business that is in itself a business for good because it's creating local solutions to local problems. We're not destroying any employment by shipping you know, products from other countries there. Um, you know, in Canada, if you were to say, we're going to ship you a bunch of t-shirts and just give them away for free, or in the U.S., it's illegal. It's called dumping product. Uh, but you can do it in Africa all you want. You can go there, you can ship whatever you want, um, even with the right intent, uh, and sometimes have unforeseen uh, side effects. So we've tried, you know, we've learned from that. Um, we, we didn't, we never did that, but we've seen the effects and we've adopted this model of creating local social enterprises, creating skills, creating employment, while trying to um, save lives uh, from clean water. 
that that's amazing and i'm i'm really glad that you took the time to to tell that story and talk about how you work in the in those other countries um i was going to ask about how you work in in the other countries that you work in um where did you find the water filter that you then that you're then teaching other people how to build so one of uh, one of my friends who lives in elmira um close by uh, is an engineering company and they've been working in south sudan um, and Uganda for a few years installing these filters. So my first trip, you know, to South Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, um, Kenya was with these folks. Uh, we had sponsored a few filters and installed them. So that's kind of how we got started in it. And it's just kind of grown from there. Now we're in, I think we're in six countries and we are hoping and planning if things open up and travel opens up to be able to go to Haiti and add that as our seventh, seventh okay. country to work in. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Um, thank if you could, so much. Sorry, say, go ahead, Matthew. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to uh, commend Helmi. I think that's an, an excellent thing that he brought up on, you know, the aid bottle. That's something we teach that we actually teach our students about and why we like Aim to Flourish that, you know, we really try to focus on businesses that are helping communities help themselves. And it's not this old paternalistic model of dumping, as you said, right? Um, I actually think I, I thought I read something the other day that it, I don't know if it was in Nairobi or just Kenya as a country is passing legislation to actually stop or limit dumping because it's becoming so bad, right? And this is something we've we've talked about with a lot of the other businesses, like you know the one-to-one -one model that we see in Tom Shoes and you know things like that. We look at that, and that's been you know as you said, the intent is often uh, comes from a good place and it's altruistic. It can have these unintended consequences. So. Um, Really, that's why we like Aim to Flourish is that it gets to focus on businesses that are, you know, a force for good and then allow communities to be sustainable on their own and, and not dependent on on aid. Well, thank you. We we like Aim to Flourish for that reason, too. But <laughs> it's uh, I'm really glad to hear that that's something that you've been able to bring into your class, not not just Aim to Flourish, but that concept of of business and helping communities to be sustainable um, that that feels very important to me, to me personally, but it's a great thing that to teach your students. And it's great to hear from businesses that are actually doing that and setting the example for others. Helmi, I'm hoping that I know that the interview was a while ago with the students and, um, you know, we, we do our flourish prizes, you know, the year after the story is written. Um, but I'm wondering if you remember anything about that interview and if you can share a little bit with us about that interview that you had with the students that, that wrote your story. Well, um, yeah, it was a while ago, but, you know, with um, a lot of the students that come in, as Matthew pointed out, they're often very nervous. Um, they don't know what to ask and if, you know, there's boundaries you can cross or not. But I think as soon as we start sitting down and talking and they realize we're just people trying to do you know, our part to, to A, make a living and B, you know, pay a living wage to our staff and C, try and do the right thing. Um, I think it switches on a light for them to say, this isn't a pipe dream. I can actually dream of a career. I can dream of a future for myself where I don't have to be part of the corporate culture that I'm seeing lay off my parents, that I'm seeing you know, um, with the subprime mortgages crashing with like people losing their homes. And there's so much um, disenchantment with um, with the large corporate environment um, and the level of trust in business. Um, I read somewhere right now is at an all time low. Um, if you think about all the issues that our next generation is going to have to fix they're massive. The baggage that they're being given, whether it's society or environment or whatever it is, there is so much baggage for them to fix. We can't let them feel that they're burdened to the point where there is no hope. Um, they have to believe that if they dream that through their work, they can try and make a difference and it, it is possible. Um, I think it inspires them to you know, maybe be entrepreneurs on their own someday and trying to do something that um, that is a business that tries to change the world and tries to make things better. Um, initially, when we started out, we were donating money to charity. And I think that's amazing. And as much as you can, please give to charities because they're, they're trying to do the right thing. As a business person, I step back and I think how the world works. 
they say love makes the world go round. And as much as I'd love to believe that, I've come to learn that it's actually money that makes the world go round. And if you think about it, if you think about how to make change, um, you need money to be able to make change. 3% of the world's economy, 3%, about this much, is nonprofits. 97% of the world's economy is for-profit business. So if we're going to make a dramatic shift and accelerate towards fixing our environmental catastrophe that we're all facing with climate change and, and deforestation and, and the loss of species around us, if we're going to be able to stop a million people from dying because the water that they're drinking is full of fecal coliforms and bacteria and E. coli, something simple as that, and the other issues that we're facing, this 97% has to solve that problem. We can't keep waiting for governments to come in to, to go do this. They all make us these promises. Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then four more years pass. Don't wait for government. Governments, there's three constituents. There's governments, people, and business, right? Everybody's pointing a finger at each, at each other. Governments are saying, we're going to wait for business. People are saying, oh, the governments aren't doing anything. And the business, and no. Business, 97% of the world's economy, honestly, we have the ability to set the agenda and change course of society and history. Um, the B Corp movement and businesses that are in the B Corp movement and like-minded businesses who may or may not be B Corps have that power because we have, we talk to consumers, consumers buy from us. We can educate these consumers to say, look, this is what B Corps do. This is how your product made a difference. This is how your choice makes a difference. How buying a sustainable product makes things better. And then we meet with business leaders and we meet with, like I meet with ministers and people, they come to our office, they tour us and they talk to us and I keep telling them about our story and it inspires them to say, oh, I guess, you know, this whole thing, you're, you guys aren't unicorns. You, businesses like these actually exist. Uh, and we should be paying more attention to them and we should be trying to raise the profile of these kind of businesses who are willing to do these things. So where the money goes is where action follows. Business is where the money is. We have to set the example. If a small company like Grosh that started in a laundry room can do it, I think a lot of other people um, should feel confident that they can stick their neck out, they can take a stand, they can make this happen, and they should talk about it. They should talk about the things that they're good at and where they're struggling and where they're trying to make things work because it isn't easy to turn a business around and turn a business you know, into a B Corp type movement. It takes time but recognize what you have to do uh, and start to make that change. Um, yeah, that's a, that's that 97% of the pie, I think, uh, where the solution is. Matthew, I hope that every single one of your students gets to interview somebody like Helmi. <laughs> well, it's actually really funny. I remember, again, like you said, it was almost like two years, almost two years ago now, or two Septembers ago, or um, that this was being done. Actually, maybe it was in December, in the winter. Um, I seem to remember them coming back saying, oh, he was awesome. He was so cool to talk to. Um, and then we were thinking for our next um, charitable event that we do. I'm like, oh, we should have him come speak. And maybe some of our some of our profits uh, are often split between a few different charities. Maybe we can send it to his charity. Um, so I think that's actually in our in our in our thinking in the future is that hopefully, you know, last year they raised about one hundred thousand dollars in their in their charitable event. Uh, and I know about 25,000 that went to Doctors Without Borders um, and the Nature, Cons Nature Conservancy of Canada and to Sick Kids Hospital. Um, and I think our next one, I don't know if we'll get to do it this year um, with everything, but hopefully next year that we'd love for Grosh to be a part of it. And uh, maybe you could speak. Yeah, I'd be happy to support you guys any way we can. Yeah. Help me, was this the first time that you were interviewed by students for... For Aims this is the second time. We actually had University of Guelph students uh, come a couple of years before then, two or three years before then. Do you think that having the opportunity to to speak to students and get a chance to tell your story impacts the way that you see and frame your business? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, students, um, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to go and give a lot of talks at universities and colleges and events and things like that and talk about businesses that that are doing this kind of thing. Um, I find students to be very refreshing to talk to um, because um, 
you can see them in that one hour. You know, often the 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 classroom lectures start out like this. They're like, oh, I'm not a corporate <laughs> guy to talk about corporate stuff. By the end, they're like, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? Oh, well, this is cool. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And I often walk out with ideas. Um, I always feel when I speak to audiences who feel uplifted that it charges my batteries. And then for weeks and weeks, I'm like, yeah, 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 we gotta go, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. So um, yeah, I, I enjoy it. That's great. Um, d doing these interviews has had a little bit of this, the same effect on me. You know, I, I go and I talk to students that are going to do the assignment or I talk to students at my own university and um, I'm going to have to play this interview for all of them instead of having them listen to me now <laughs> because I feel like you're saying all of the things that I'm, I try to tell the students. Um, even, even so much is just about, about going into the interview and being, and being nervous and then hearing from the business leader, the entrepreneur about you know, their story and feeling like that's something that they're able to do themselves. So I don't know, Matthew, if, if you feel like your student, like you get that story from from your students a lot. Oh, all the time. Yeah, all the time. I, I you know, students are when they come, like I said earlier, when they come back from um, meeting the business owners, they just speak. They're just they're they're very different. They're like, oh, that was so cool. Like they go into it like super nervous. Um, around here, they've gone to like sheep farms and like cider breweries and like all these weird things like that, but companies are doing really great things and they get to meet these really unique people who are just very passionate about their work. Um, as Helmi is, right? Like it, it, yeah. You can't help but be passionate knowing that you're have a, a, a thriving career, but also you're a force for good in the world. And I think it's inspiring for students as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely, my favorite part of, of this whole Aim to Flourish experience and, and getting to see it from so many students at so many different universities around the world, you can tell them like, you're going to do this interview and it's it's going to be really great. And they're still like, oh my God, class assignment. Um, but, you know, once you do it and you get a chance to talk to somebody like Helmi or, you know, meant so many of the entrepreneurs or business leaders that our students talk to, you're like, oh, wait a minute, like, this is something that I can do. I do feel inspired. Like, this was a great experience. I'm glad I got out of the classroom. Thank you so much to Matthew Mulharn from Beyond Borders for being here with us today um, from Guelph, Ontario, and to Helmi Ansari from Grosch International, um, our Flourish Prize honorees for Global Goal 6, Clean Water and Sanitation. It's been an absolute honor to get a chance to speak with both of you today. Um, and I've really appreciated it. And I can't wait to share this story with our audience.